John Edwards with ChineseEconomicHistory.com and we're here today at the uh, World Economic History Congress being held in Kyoto, Japan. And on this occasion, which is the first time that the World Economic History Congress has come to the Far East, uh, we're trying to take advantage of this chance and interview some prominent econ Chinese economic historians. Uh, and today we have with us Chang Cheng, uh, a Chinese economic historian. He received his PhD from Northern Illinois University and he's currently a prof uh, professor of economics at Shandong University in China. Um, so first off, uh, uh, our viewers at uh, ChineseEconomicHistory.com are quite interested in, in the long-run performance of uh, China's economy. So I'd like to ask you quickly uh, a few uh, basic questions about China. Okay. Um, the standard view uh, by most growth and development economists uh, with regard to the world uh, economic performance and also most countries uh, economic performance is that they experienced a Malthusian trap and then at some point uh, they made a transition to economic growth. Uh, given this view of the West, would you say China's path, uh, excuse me, China's development path was the same as the West's? Well, no, it's quite different. Okay. Uh, for one thing, that China didn't escape the Massachusetts trap, and it, uh, China was actually pretty much in the rest of the world. And then the Western Europe uh, was the only one exception that their economy took off around 1750 after the Industrial Revolution. I so, see. Yeah. Okay, and the next question I can't, uh, I can't resist is, is it's, uh, my own uh, topic of interest. Uh, what's your view of the economic performance of uh, China's Song Dynasty? Uh, it was a period of uh, rapid economic growth uh, compared with other uh, times of the Chinese history. And uh, there are many indicators you can look at. You will see uh, the Song economic performance is just uh, outperformed uh, later dynasty like the Ming and Qing. Say you can look at the urbanization rate. Uh, it was much higher in the Song than in the Ming and Qing. And also if you look at the per capita uh, output of metal, like the steel, iron, and all these metals, and it was much higher also in the Song than in the Qing. And then economic historians have uh, come up with estimates of per capita GDP. It was uh, over $1,000 uh, in, you know. Uh, it was also much higher than the later Ming and Qing, so. I see. Yeah, so. Well, let me ask you, since you're uh, in mainland China, uh, and uh, I know from my visit with you in, in Shandong University uh, a couple of years ago, uh, you're in contact with many historians as well, as well over there. Um, what is the impression or the consensus, if there is one, amongst Song China experts uh, in China on China's uh, economic performance uh, during the Song Dynasty? Yeah, there is a general consensus among Chinese uh, experts on the Song on the uh, Dynasty that the, uh, the Song Dynasty is actually uh, one of the you know, most uh, well-governed dynasty and economic performance is just outstanding in terms of the whole Chinese history. So uh, it's, it's, it, it, maybe we can, say, we can say that it's the best uh, uh, economy in the history of China. Yeah. I see. And d just to be clear, uh, per capita income and population both increased when, when you say economic yes, growth. Yes, exactly. And uh, how was the, the pace of technological innovation uh, during the Song Dynasty relative to? Uh, the, uh, the pace of inter, uh, technology invention actually accelerated in the Song Dynasty uh, because uh, if you look at the uh, history of science and technology in China, Song uh, Dynasty uh, was a very active period that uh, you see the four, the four major uh, invention from China, originating from China, three of them were, you know, uh, happened in the Song Dynasty. And there are many, uh, you know, inventions that uh, we can point to that actually originated from the Song Dynasty. So it's a very technologically active uh, period. 
So j just for our viewers, the uh, Chinese have a tradition of talking about the the four major, uh, in, four big inventions. It's the uh, gunpowder, paper, printing, and the compass. Yes. Uh, the uh, uh, Western tradition is to talk about Bacon's three major uh, three? inventions. Okay. I think he ble I think he uh, mentions printing. Uh, gunpowder printing and, and, and gunpowder, but the Chinese say four. Compers. Yeah, uh, but three out of the four were during the Song Dynasty yes. when they came out. Okay, enough for background uh, for uh, our interested viewers. Uh, I'd like to move on to your interest in Chinese economic history. Uh, and I understand uh, you're quite interested in the relation of climate shocks with various aspects. Could you tell us a bit about your own research in this? Yeah, the one difficulty in doing research in term, in the economic history is the issue of endogeneity because everything is related to everything else. Say, but we as researchers, we want to identify causal effects. So uh, one way to get around this that is if we can look at some exogenous shocks like climate shocks. So that's why in the recent years I've been focusing on the effect of uh, climate shocks on uh, Chinese economic development in the long run. Uh, so, so that way I think if we can isolate uh, these effects of these external uh, shocks, and then we can uh, look at the internal working of the Chinese society uh, in more detail. Yeah. And, and what particular aspects are, are, are you considering? Uh, as related to climate shocks? Uh, one is that the, the uh, likelihood of war and conflict, uh, say, between the nomads uh, in the north of China and, and China proper. And also uh, peasant up uprisings because of the cl bad climate, bad weather shocks, like drought or flood or, or, or these, these disasters that could, uh, you know, uh, drove peasants into rebellion. Yeah. So uh, nomadic conquest and peasant rebellions. Mm -hmm. uh, you've also mentioned before the uh, uh, cohesion of, of China, you think, is related. Yes, I think that's also related to these climate shocks, because my data show that uh, there's some effect because of the frequency of disaster uh, would have, uh, if the disaster happened more frequently, it would require government to provide disaster relief. And that would means you need a bigger government. Uh, so, and I also see the pattern in the data that that could explain uh, a, 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 a portion of the fluctuation in how united or divided China was in the history. So it sounds like you're using quantitative data to to, yes. to analyze this. Quantitative, yes. And and uh, kind of econometrics and statistical analysis yes, as well. Yes, exactly. So this is very and this is very modern Chinese economic history in the sense that you you're using quantitative data and yeah. models to do yeah. that. that. That's it. And that's interesting. Uh, and what type of a time period are you looking at when you're talking about unification uh, of China? And it's pretty like much in the uh, past the 2,000 years okay. uh, since, say, the establishment of the Qing Qin dynasty in yep. the 221 BCE. Mm -hmm. And then I will look at uh, the time, whole time series uh, every decade as an observation unit. So I, so basically I will have like uh, 200, a little bit over 200 observations in my sample. So yeah. T is T Sometimes is I years. use annual data, but, uh, but you know, I also use uh, every decade as observation unit. Yeah. So T Depends is, on the situation. T is a decade, decade. in general. That's, yes. that, 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 that's good long run Chinese economic history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, those, uh, those three topics sound quite interesting. What else are you planning on doing in, in the uh, future? Any, any other type of uh, research related yeah. to this or something different? Yeah, I would, I would continue to work on the effect of climate shock on society, uh, you know, broadly defined, different aspects. In particular, I'm interested in the effect of climate uh, shocks on institutions. Uh, because uh, economists have done a lot of research about the effect of institutions on economic performance, but what determines institutions? We still don't know much. Mm -hmm. And I think the geography and climate uh, as a long-run driver, a determinant of institution, and we still have a lot more to know. 
So in my future work, uh, I would like to look at the uh, like uh, cross-country uh, data to see because there are, there are a lot of variations in terms of institutions mm -hmm. across country. And also uh, a lot of variations in terms of climate condition, geography. So I want to see whether these two are related in certain ways in a quantitative uh, manner. Yeah. That's interesting. So you're going to look at uh, climate, ch uh, climate changes across countries and also across countries, uh, the types of institutions that exist. Uh, it's certainly easy to imagine different institutions across countries in a, in a cross-country analysis. Yep. But in terms of climate shocks, can you tell us a little bit about what uh, different types of climate shocks w w w would yeah, yeah, you yeah. have in mind when you look at this? Uh, well, the uh, uh, those uh, geo Ge ge geography, uh, I mean, the uh, people uh, have uh, working to reconstruct uh, this uh, uh, historical temperature, rainfall, and disaster data. And so uh, one particular uh, aspect of this uh, climate that I'm in interested in will be in the frequency of disasters. W say, what type of disasters? Say drought, okay. flood and uh, you know, extreme cold or, or frost, mm. snow. Mm -hmm. And uh, a society that is of, you know, under frequent attack of disasters, they will require, generally require, intuitively require a bigger government mm -hmm. to help relieve the disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this will help the, uh, the state formation. Okay, and then the state, I mean, is a very big uh, uh, plays a big part in institution building. Okay, so that's one just one starting point, and then I will I will just keep working in that area. Okay. I see. So uh, one last question: How long have you been working on on this climate change as the relations uh, to various aspects of yeah, country society? At least in the past five years. I see. Yeah. So you've been working on it in five years. Maybe more than yeah. Five, five or six five. years. I yeah. see. Well, it sounds very interesting. I'm looking forward to your, your work coming out. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for your time uh, and coming over thank for Thank you an for interview. inviting me. And I uh, hope you enjoy the uh, rest of the uh, World Economic History Congress here today. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Edwards with ChineseEconomicHistory.com and we're here today at the uh, World Economic History Congress being held in Kyoto, Japan and on this occasion which is the first time that the World Economic History Congress has come to the Far East uh, we're trying to take advantage of this chance and interview some prominent econ Chinese economic historians uh, and today we have with us Chang Cheng, uh, a Chinese economic historian. He received his PhD from Northern Illinois University, and he's currently a prof uh, professor of economics at Shandong University in China. Um, so first off, uh, uh, our viewers at uh, ChineseEconomicHistory.com are quite interested in, in the long-run performance of uh, China's economy. So I'd like to ask you quickly uh, a few uh, basic questions about China. Okay. Um, the standard view uh, by most growth and development economists uh, with regard to the world uh, economic performance and also most countries' uh, economic performance is that they experienced a Malthusian trap and then at some point uh, they made a transition to economic growth. Uh, given this view of the West, would you say China's path, uh, excuse me, China's development path was the same as the West's? Well, no, it's quite different. Okay. Uh, for one thing,